So again, before I introduce Kathleen as our distinguished scholar, she sends her most humble apologies for not being able to be here um, in person this morning. As mentioned, she's recuperating from a medical issue under doctor's orders, uh, not being able to travel. But fortunately, technology allows us to still have her with us, even though it's virtually. Um, so we're going to have some pre prepared remarks and a pre-recorded video that we'll be able to, to watch. But before we do that, I want to, you know, you, many of us know her work already, but just sort of to take, take back and reflect a little bit on her work and what she's done for the field of, of uh, manager organizational cognition. So Kathleen M. Sutcliffe is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at John Hopkins University with appointments in both the Cary Business School and the School of Medicine, which actually says a lot about her work. As many of you know, Kathleen was on the faculty at Stephen M. Ross School of Business at University of Michigan for more than 20 years, with four of those years serving as Associate Dean for Faculty and Research. She holds a PhD in Management from the University of Texas at Austin a Master's in Nursing from the University of Washington, a BS from the University of Alaska, and a BA from the University of Michigan. Quite the overachiever. That's awesome. Professor Sutcliffe has made an indelible and integral mark on the field of manager and organizational cognition. Her impactful scholarly work seeks to understand organizational adaptability, reliability, and resilience. One stream of work focuses on top management teams and group dynamics, including information search processes, sense-making and learning processes, and how these elements affect firm performance. In a second stream of work, she investigates organizational reliability, particularly how an organization's design and culture influence organizational capabilities to sense, cope with, and respond to surprises and changing demands. Her research also exam examines what enables organizations as well as teams and individuals to be resilient. She has published her work across a wide range of top quality journals, across disciplines, and across both research and practice. It's almost impossible to list out all the journals, so just think of how wide and deep she's gone with her research. Now one indication, not the only, but one indication of her influence on the field is evident in her more than 4,000 book of science citations as a lagging indicator, with more than 16,000 Google Scholar citations. In addition to her scholarly work upon which this award is based, she's also given generously of her time and expertise within our division. She has been a longtime facilitator of the Cognition of the Rough PUW, at least nine years. She is known as a top mentor to her students and PhD mentees. Now, before studying for a doctoral degree, she served as Director of Health and Social Services for the Lucian Pribilo Islands Association, one of, the, uh, one of the 13 regional Alaska Native corporations, also served as the program manager for the state of Alaska. And here's my favorite part. She also worked as a deckhand on a crab fishing boat <laughs> and as a laborer on the construction of the Alaska pipeline. That's amazing. That's just awesome. So again, we are so honored to award Kathleen M. Sotcliffe the 2015 MOC Distinguished Scholar Award. And here receiving the honor in her place is Christopher Myers, one of her most recent PhD students. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank you for this honor. I'm obviously thrilled and humbled. I have to say, before I opened Elizabeth's email telling me that I had received the award, I thought to myself, uh-oh, you know, I haven't volunteered for enough MOC activities. And I was really all set to say yes to the request. So I have to say that when I read down into Elizabeth's email, I was shocked, but it was an unexpected and lovely surprise. And I had every intention of being with you this morning in person, but unfortunately, fate, as it often does, intervened. And my best laid plans, well, they didn't work out the way that I thought they would. Nonetheless, I'm glad to be with you virtually today. So today, I want to do two things uh, this morning. I want to first talk about our scholarship, and particularly our division scholarship, scholarship in MOC, in the MOC domain. And second, I want to talk a little bit about academic life and its challenges. You know, over the past several years, I have been reading and thinking a lot about resilience and renewal. And I want to perhaps unashamedly 
propose some ideas for how all of us might engage with the challenges of academic life and keep engaged and vital. And my hope is that these ideas will resonate with all of you, but I particularly hope that they resonate with those of you who are early in your careers. So let me start talking about our scholarship, and I want to ground my comments about scholarship in some benchmarks proposed by John Gardner. Now, Gardner was a leading scholar in the latter 20th century, but most organizational scholars probably have never heard of him. He actually received a PhD in psychology from Berkeley. He held a number of academic positions, but he mostly served in public life. He wrote a great book on renewal, which I think is still relevant today. But I'm most interested in how Gardner thought of the aim of the university and scholarship. Gardner suggested that the university and its scholarships stands for things that are forgotten in the heat of the battle, or the yeah, heat of the battle, values that get pushed aside in the rough and tumble of everyday living, the goals we ought to be thinking about and never do, questions we lack the courage to ask, and the facts we don't like to face. So let me use that framework to talk about our scholarship. Things that are forgotten in the heat of the battle. You know, I wonder whether in the heat of the battle and in the name of theoretical progress that we have prematurely abandoned attention to older and perhaps mundane cognition ideas. In particular, I'm thinking about the role of perception, the role of selective perception, and the central role that mindsets and beliefs play in processes of cognition, sense-making, and more critically, in organizing. You know, maybe we've assumed that these are settled matters, or we simply take these processes for granted, or perhaps we've overlaid them with more current concepts or theories. Uh, there are probably a number of plausible explanations for the relative lack of research in these three founda foundational areas. I did a quick Google Ngrams analysis, and I compared the terms managerial, managerial perception and sense-making between 1956 and 2015. Now, taking managerial perception, between 1956 and 2015, there were two periods during which interest in managerial perception surged. In the early 1970s, I think that was a time when scholars were trying to understand how managers perceive uncertainty. And in the early 1990s, when there was a lot of work in the areas of managerial and organizational scanning. Starting in about the mid-1990s and continuing to today, we see a decline in, with respect to uh, evidence that uh, managerial perception is kind of showing up in the literature. In contrast, if we look at sense-making, we see a meteoric rise kind of starting in the early 1990s and continuing on to today. A quick review of key journals, of course, affirms these findings. You rarely uh, find anything related to perceiving, but sense-making research shows up repeatedly in our journals. And in fact, you know, we're seeing more and more systematic literature reviews of sense-making. For example, Sally Maitlis and Marlis Christensen's review that was published last year in the Academy of Management Annals, and a review by Jorgen Sandberg and Harry Sukas published this year in the Journal of Organizational Behavior. These critical reviews, I think they do a wonderful job highlighting what knowledge has accumulated in the sense-making domain. And they highlight gaps, and they highlight areas for future research. For example, we know that sense-making is triggered by events. You know, they can be minor or major, planned or unplanned. What's common is that these events create a sense of disruptive ambiguity. And generally speaking, it's plausible to think that sense-making occurs through interrelated processes of creation, interpretation, and enactment. But one key problem that has been a concern to me for a while is that most studies don't seem to make a distinction between the creation part of sense-making and the interpretation part. We often treat them as one and the same. So sense-making becomes synonymous with processes of interpretation, and then it ends up all being taken as a process of cognition. 
I worry that by lumping so much together and doing so much work in the latter parts of the sense-making process that we've forgotten that there is more to this. There's more in need of understanding. Perception, selective perception, that's kind of called creation in the sense-making literature, I think they're central to sense-making and organizing. And, you know, I do appreciate that we have to take care in creating distinctions, or as Sandberg and Sukas say, in isolating features of sense-making that should be bundled together. But I do think that we need to know more about what influences what people carve out and hang on to. How do events come to be treated as events in the first place? I worry that in the heat of the battle that we've forgotten or overlooked how crucial and foundational perception, selective perception, and mindsets are to organizational life and organizational outcomes. The reason I think this is because, or the reason I think it's such a big deal, I guess I should say, is that Carl Weick and I, in our work on managing the unexpected, uh, our work where we're trying to understand organizational reliability under dynamic conditions, we found that issues of perception, conception, and understanding often underpin or organizational surprises that sometimes turn into crises or even catastrophes. Crises and catastrophes are rarely issues of execution and performance. The problems start long before the chaos arrives in the small, mundane, everyday details that get left out, ignored, or normalized, details that get miscategorized, or because of deeply held mindsets, details that get misunderstood. We see repeatedly in our work how misperception, misconception, and misunderstanding play a key role in many events, for example, in the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster in 2003. We see these playing a role in the excess pediatric cardiac surgical deaths over a 10-year period in the Bristol Royal Infirmary in the UK. And more recently, uh, we see how these elements played a role in Toyota's slow recognition and response to its unintended acceleration problem. So, to avoid treating sense-making as synonymous inter with interpretation and cognition, I think we really need to go back to better understand foundational issues. And when we do, we, wanna be, we will want to pay close attention to individuals in their context, the roles they play, who they think they are, their identities, the knowledge they draw on when they act, and the ways in which they interact with other people. Michelle Barton, Tim Vogus, Teddy DeWitt, and I, I think we take a step to better understand these early micro moments in sense making in a recent study of wildland firefighters. Now, we wanted to answer the following question, and that question was what organizing practices enable frequent and rapid sense making under dynamic uncertainty? We propose that. Performing under, dynamic un performing under dynamic uncertainty requires attention and alertness to emerging and changing details, but it also requires discernment and understanding of what those details mean. We hypothesized that it requires what we called contextualized engagement of organizational actors at different hierarchical levels. We specifically hypothesized that effective performance would be enabled in the presence of two major factors. First, when people on the front lines actively work to hang on to small discrepancies, small contextual details that they're concerned with. We called this seeking anomalies or anomalizing in contrast to normalizing. And second, when leaders proactively exhibit behaviors aimed at enabling the incorporation of these details in a comprehensive and continuous story. When leaders enable sense-making, and we called this proactive leader sense-making. In part, what we are trying to do was to build on Baron and Misovich's idea of a shareability constraint. That idea is that when people share their knowledge to coordinate their actions, that they shift from knowledge by acquaintance or perceptually based knowing to knowledge by description or categorically based knowing. When that happens, people lose details and so people know less and less. 
And the goal in managing dynamic uncertainty is really to facilitate conversations of acquaintance rather than conversations edited so solely by description. So in our study of over 500 wildland firefighters, we, str we found strong support for our theorizing. The, con the contextualized practices enacted by leaders and frontline workers fueled performance in part because they enabled these firefighting crews to hold on to important discrepancies as situations unfolded, and also to develop a richer understanding of what they faced. In the end, this promoted capabilities to contingently tailor actions to unfolding conditions. So the point of all this is, is that we might want to keep our eye on whether we've prematurely forgotten some fundamental processes that we may now take for granted, but may not truly understand. We probably all have a sense of the values that get pushed aside or get lost uh, in the rough and tumble of academic life and daily life. Um, if you think about it, uh, and, and I'm thinking about our research in academic lives, you know, over the past two decades, I've thought a lot about the values of our research cultures. You know, whether our culture fosters respect for others, respect for the differences in our world views and our research pursuits, and particularly respect for doctoral students and the process of becoming a scholar. Now, do we value students' insights, views, and, and ideas? Do we treat them with respect? Do we take advantage of them in untoward ways? Are we attempting to create equal opportunities for those who are un unlike us? And do we value going the extra mile in crafting developmental opportunities for doctoral students? You know, like other professions and occupations, and when I say this, I'm thinking of medicine in particular, we sometimes treat students like novices, people who have to be tested, people who have to prove themselves. And the problem is that when we treat people like novices who have to be tested, that we sometimes, perhaps inadvertently, create a culture where students are left on their own. And when that happens, I think learning suffers. So the research cultures that I've been part of have sincerely valued student development as well as student autonomy. We valued supporting students' efforts and stepping in before they failed. But in my experience and discussions with doctoral students and other colleagues around the world, this isn't a universal norm. And I think that we should be more conscious of it. Other values that sometimes get pushed aside relate to the extent to which we value honesty and integrity in the conduct of our research, and the extent to which we let performance and production pressures kind of lead us to shortcuts or other actions that might undermine our work in some way or might compromise us or our students or our institutions. Another value that we sometimes push aside relates to valuing the insights of other disciplines and what they can bring to the organization's scholarship table. I know what hard work it is to collaborate with people outside our discipline. I'm working on a couple of projects now with physicians. And I also recently worked on a project with some researchers from the natural sciences. And in fact, they were physicists. And it's really hard work. You know, We know experts are subject to the fallacy of centrality. And that's the idea, if they don't know about a phenomenon, that it must not be happening. And when you think you're at the center of an information network, well, what does it do? It dampens your curiosity to learn about things outside your discipline. But it also, in my experience, kind of influences how well you might listen to other people, what attention you might pay to the validity of their ideas. But if we're going to make headway on some, some important issues, for example, an area that I'm uh, investigating right now, how to make healthcare safer, we need that variety. We need the variety that different disciplines bring to the table. Now, I often hear people saying that interdisciplinary work is critical to the achievement of organization studies, but we sometimes don't have the patience or the time or the wisdom or, you know, the insight to engage in the process. So knowledge advancements suffer. One final value that gets slighted in a marketplace for ideas, I think, is the value of careful listening and listening more than we speak. We often want to advocate rather than inquire and listen. 
You know, earlier I mentioned issues of perception and conception and their relationship and the shareability constraint, the concern that details get lost when they're converted into common descriptions. When we organize, we can't avoid the loss of information and understanding. But, you know, we can be more deliberate in searching for ways to enrich our discourse. You know, when two people talk to one another, their worlds are different. But as Barbara Chanwaska suggests, there can be no third version of the world that is more correct than these two. There can only be a third version of the world that explains to them why their versions differed. You know, we're all experts in our own world. Without keen listening, continual inquiry, all wrapped up in a context of respectful interaction, there can be no equivalent understanding. So what goals do we neglect? You know, much has been written about the increasing irrelevance of uh, organizational studies. And, you know, if you go back and read the first issue of ASQ that was published in the 1950s, I think 1956, you see that the founders of ASQ, they characterize the field's reason for being so as to develop a, a grand unified theory of administration that could provide a sound foundation for effective administrative behavior. Now, in the mid-1980s, when I began my doctoral studies, there were multiple commentaries on the trade-off between rigor and relevance, and actually many of them were written by Academy of Management presidents, such as uh, Don Hambrick and Jean Bartunek, and even earlier by Fred Luthens and John Slocum. And these scholars asked whether organizational scholars actually had been successful in doing uh, balancing this trade-off. The founders of organization science, Dick Daft and Ari Lewin, actually, in 1990, they identified the issue of relevance as one motivating factor for starting the journal. So one would have thought that we would have solved that problem by now, but scholars are still paying attention to the rigor relevance trade-off. For example, Don Palmer and his colleagues did a really nice analysis that was published a couple of years ago in the Journal of Management Inquiry. And you might want to take a, a look at that. But, you know, my own view is that good organization science should reflect a concern both with understanding and use. And I maintain that our research, particularly research in MOC, is critical to understanding and even perhaps cracking some key social problems. And this fact actually is being recognized by people outside our discipline. Let me give you one example. A couple of years ago, Atul Gawande, who is the famous Harvard surgeon, and he's a journalist, and he wrote the book The Checklist Manifesto, he gave a commencement speech to the graduating students at William, Williams College in the U.S., um, and I had a chance to um, actually uh, listen to a speech, but it was also highlighted uh, in the New Yorker uh, magazine. And he highlighted in that speech how critical the notion of organizational resilience is, especially to healthcare organizations that want to perform well. I think a lot about organizational resilience and the ways to achieve it, and I think that the ways to achieve resilience in healthcare are central to the domain of MOC, or I guess you could say it the other way around. MOC is central to understanding resilience in healthcare. Let me give you the example. You know, think about surgery. Although surgery has become relatively safe and routine, healthcare institutions continue to vary widely in their outcomes, especially mortality rates. And of course, you're probably sitting there saying, well, you know, what accounts for the fact that healthcare, you know, organizations differ in mortality rates? Most people would think that the best institutions simply are better at preventing things from going wrong. But that's not the case, actually. Uh, that hypothesis has been contradicted by a series of studies from some surgeons I'm working with at the University of Michigan. And in fact, what these surgeons found in a set of studies is that the low mortality hospitals do not do a better job at controlling risks or preventing post surgical complications. So let me just repeat that. You know, what my colleagues, Amir Gaffari, John Berkmeyer, and Justin Dimmick, has shown is that the low mortality hospitals, those are the hospitals with better outcomes, do not do a better job of controlling risks or preventing post-surgical complications. In fact, 
they found that high and low mortality hospitals experienced relatively similar complication rates after surgeries. What differed, in their words, was the rate at which the high mortality hospitals failed to rescue. Low mortality hospitals were more proficient at recognizing and managing serious complications as they unfolded. Now, I have to admit that I'm not keen on the term failure to rescue. I'd rather think about the opposite, processes of rescuing. I think of rescuing as the proficient recognizing and managing of complications as they unfold. And I consider it to be an instance of a general pattern that my colleagues Carl Weick and Tim Vogus and I have labeled mindful organizing. You know, if you think about it, rescuing, whether successful or unsuccessful, involves recursive interactions between, uh, between kind of perceiving, sensing, interpreting, and updating, and acting in a dynamic unfolding situation. It's a process of discovery. It's a process of discovery carried out under pressures, pressure from a deteriorating patient, pressure on the relations among members of a treatment team that is generally you know, not all together, uh, that's diffused throughout the organization. You know, resilient healthcare is a dynamic, ongoing accomplishment and organizational cognition. Uh, as I said, sensing, creating, sense-making, and enacting are critical because the, the goal is an improved grasp of what may be evolving so that actions and interventions can be tailored to the evolving present. So, you know, we all have questions that we fear. You know, we all have questions that we ignore, questions we overlook, or that we simply lack the courage to ask. And one important question that's been on my mind is, you know, to what extent does the name of our division constrain our research efforts? Now, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the name managerial and organizational cognition suggests a focus on the top. But increasingly, actually, I think the action is really on the bottom. For example, my work with many of my co-authors, including Michelle Barton and Tim Vogus and Carl Weick, has shown repeatedly that the, cognition, the cognitions of those on the front lines are critical for picking up on weak signals of organizational vulnerability. And that these cognitions and their associated adaptive actions are crucial for organizational adaptability, resilience, and sustained performance. Perhaps this is captured in the organizational cognition part of our division's name, but perhaps not. You know, in any event, I think processes of cognition are broader than we may be thinking, and they're not just ma managerial. Let me give you another example. You know, Ned Wellman at Arizona State is studying the role of informal leadership and group functioning, particularly the importance of shared leadership schemas. Now, what do we know? We know that informal leadership is often vital to the success of contemporary organizations, especially organizations in complex and ambiguous environments. We know that prior studies have shown that groups and organizations function more effectively if leadership is shared across members in hierarchical levels. This means that leadership isn't simply reserved for people in positions of formal authority or people at the top, but rather it should be a shared function that anyone can fulfill, regardless of their job title or level. Now what the neat thing is, is what Ned and his colleagues have found in a series of studies is that informal leadership among the group is more likely to emerge when the members of a group hold cognitive schemas that the leadership, the leadership task should be shared among the members of the group rather than simply initiated by a single individual. I think this example calls into question again the focus on the top or a focus on managers, the focus, the focus on managers. So, in fact, you know, I wonder if managers are the constituency with which MOC scholars in particular want to engage with. And I guess I say that because in the past few months I've come across several, several commentaries questioning whether people in organizations even identify as managers anymore. And if they don't, well, maybe we need to disinvest in the term. It's really hard to get a good read on the status of management. We know that over the years that it's been lauded, it's been maligned. And a, a study by Brocklehurst, Gray, and Sturdy that was published a couple years ago 
in the journal Management Learning, it suggests that people who might be thought of as managers and who, in fact, hold a formal title of manager, do not describe, them, describe themselves as a manager. In fact, you know, in a sample of 54 executive MBA respondents, not one person self-identified as a manager. They describe themselves as consultants or advocates, professionals, directors, entrepreneurs, change agents, mavericks, and leaders. Uh, and if, this isn't to say that these people were not doing activities that we might think of as managing. In fact, many of them were managing projects. In teasing out some of the reasons for this, the scholars found that the respondents reported that they felt there was, in fact, a kind of stigma associated with the term manager, both because the activity of managing is no longer rare or distinctive, but more importantly because it connotes something undesirable. In fact, these respondents thought that they would be tainted if they described themselves as a manager. Who knows, maybe it's because the term management conjures issues related to bureaucracy and inflexibility or issues of control. Uh, I don't really know exactly what the implications are of this for management and organization studies, or more generally at uh, MOC more specifically. I raise it to simply ask the question, does this matter for our scholarship? There are probably many key facts that we avoid, you know, and what I'm going to say may be heretical, but one fact that I think we don't like to face as a field is that we really don't know much. You know, we simply don't have much accumulation of agreed upon knowledge that we can transmit to our students, whether they're undergraduates or graduate students or participants in professional education programs. You know, although there's been a surge of interest in evidence-based management, we, we know that the evidence base for many management ideas is really weak. And even where evidence exists, it sometimes isn't firm and it often overstates the generalizability of the findings. I think it's hard to know from what this lack of progress stems and maybe it's the consequence of the nature of the academic publication process, the fact that we always are focusing on coming up with a new, new thing, or there's the emphasis on theory development and construct proliferation. We know there's a lack of interest in replication studies, as many people have said, and uh, maybe most importantly, the lack of empirical testing of, of the theoretical models that show up in our work. You know, as several scholars have documented over the past decade, the fact is that the vast majority of published ideas in management have been subjected or submitted to no tests at all. And I don't think this is going to change soon. And at the same time, I don't think this means that we cannot progress in a more systematic way. In fact, it seems to me that, especially in the domain of MOC, that we would be well served by paying more attention to mechanisms-based theorizing. You know, during the last decade, there has been a growing interest in mechanisms and mechanisms-based explanations in the social sciences and sociology, uh, organization theory, and more broadly in the philosophy of science. You know, there are many definitions of mechanisms. I don't think there's a consensus about what it means. We often use the term mechanism in an offhand way. But the core idea is just the idea that there's an emphasis on explaining something. It's not just specifying a relationship, but it's specifying in detail how the regularities we have observed are brought about. So mechanisms-based theorizing strives to open up, black, open up that black box uh, to provide a better explanation which makes it easier to understand and makes our theorizing more relevant. I think that's a long way of saying that, especially in MOC, mechanisms should be at the heart of our theorizing. Just a, a brief example, a few years ago I wrote a chapter with Carl Weick on information overload. Uh, overload is pretty central to MOC and it's a domain of inquiry that I fear has not been subjected to many rig rigorous tests. In fact, you have to conclude that a lot of what we know about overload is really a little squishy. So in our chapter uh, we came at the problem of overload from an interpretive perspective rather than a computational perspective. And we proposed that information overload is a transitory sensation that's experienced by people as they develop and update schemas to help them better solve problems and perform their work. 
And we propose that a key mechanism that either lessens or heightens overload is expertise. Through an interpretive perspective, significance and the significance of, of data or information really is at the heart of an information overload problem, particularly when people don't know a priori what data from a large data field will be informative. And significance and expertise go hand in hand. You know, when one is more expert, one can better understand the significance of data and can see patterns in data and information. So overload is predominantly a phenomenon of novices and advanced beginners, and it's less so for experts. I think paradoxically um, from this work, what I found is that, you know, it suggests that a learning organization is an overloaded organization. It might also suggest that a learning orientation, which we oftentimes think of as a good thing, is an invitation to overload. So, let me just say those are some of the thoughts about our scholarship and, and now I would like to turn to the challenges of academic life and some words about how we can all engage those challenges to remain uh, more vital and uh, renewed. You know, one of my favorite Pulitzer Prize winning journalists is a journalist named Mary Schmeek. Mary writes for the Chicago Tribune and she became famous in the late 1990s when she wrote an imagined commencement speech that in cyberspace got attributed to the writer Kurt Vonnegut. You know, Mary is a really wise person, at least I think of her that way, and one of her more important pearls of wisdom relates to leading a resilient life. And what she has said and written is, you know, be careful whose advice you buy, but be patient with those who supply it. Now, I recount her words because I too am a skeptic when it comes to prescriptions, either giving them or receiving them. But of course, as you can see today, you know, that's not going to stop me. But in the end, I really doubt that I know what is right for someone else or that someone else knows what's right for me. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. You know, this theme shows up in many essays of great scholars over the years, um, and you just have to open a book to, to find it. I think it's tempting to think that someone else can show us a way. But in reality, each of us alone has to figure out our own path and on our own terms. I think the realities of professional academic life are that no other individual or group is responsible or can even be that helpful. And although there are general guidelines available, you know, the accepted wisdom in one place is often not followed in others. Now, for example, you know, what one school accepts as the list of A-level journals isn't necessarily what another school is going to think of as their list of A-level journals. How many A-level journals one must have before tenure also varies widely, and I have to say in my experience, the myths are often much greater than the reality. The emphasis one school puts on teaching versus another school also varies widely. I think, you know, when the subject is how to achieve, especially when the subject is how to achieve rather than what to achieve, we're on our own. So we each have to maintain our own inner compass and we have to pay attention to it and we have to make changes to our own course along the way. All of us get a lot of advice, particularly those of you early in your careers. Some of it's going to make sense and some of it's not going to make sense. You're going to have to pick and choose and decide what's best for you. Naturally, we know that, you know, luck and chance encounters play a role in the trajectory of our lives. Psychologist Albert Bandura, when giving his presidential address to the American Psychological Association, highlighted this quite a long time ago in the 1980s. But I don't think that means that you can't work to enact an environment that's going to foster your own human potential and enable you to do great research. And I think of great research as research that's notable, remarkable, or distinguished. So we know that there are many roads to, to the same end, and we know about equifinality, and we know that there are too many ideas to recount here, but I think there are a few things that you you're want to keep your eye on as you move forward. So the first thing is intellectual curiosity and deep engagement. You know, all of us probably wrestle with the topics that we find personally compelling and engaging. We know research takes a long time 
and in my experience, the best research takes deep engagement with a phenomenon. A wide exposure to many different literatures, oftentimes from outside our discipline, and deep, diverse experiences. My best work, I think, has come from uncertain and fuzzy beginnings, when you know things were not quite um, all worked out from the beginning. And it's come from intense engagement and virtual wrestling with ideas, sometimes wrestling with co-authors. In fact, in my first few years out of graduate school, for example, I worked on a paper with Sim Sitkin, and that paper was eventually published in AMR, and it's had a lot of recognition. I remember that we had heated discussions as we went back and forth trying to come to terms with some of our ideas. It was really hard work, but it was exciting, and it, kept, it kind of kept me engaged and enthusiastic. But it was frustrating, and at times it was exhilarating, uh, because we came to a new understanding that we didn't have. Deep engagement is also important in part because if you really care about, about a domain, you know, if you really care about what you're working on, then it's more likely that you're going to remain committed and passionate about it and you're going to persist because you're going to have many rejections and criticisms of your work and we know that persistence pays off. So you're going to want to keep close to the work, pay close attention to what is exciting and engaging. Uh, and we also know that you know, the more that we're excited and engaged with an activity and the more efficacious we feel with respect to doing it, the more likely that we're going to do it, simply for the inherent satisfaction of doing it. So in a way, learning fuels doing and doing fuels learning. You're also going to want to pay attention to your autonomy and independence. You're going to have to develop your own autonomy and independence. We know, in a way, that intellectual curiosity and autonomy go hand in hand. You're going to have to develop a thick skin. You're not going to want to always allow others to tell you what you ought to study or how it should be studied. In a way, you have to become indifferent to others' criticism and doubt. And you have to come to trust your own experience. This kind of sounds a lot easier than it is uh, to do in practice. So let me give you a couple of stories to illustrate this. Um, one story was my own story, and I and a now very famous and very rigorous co-author, we sought out advice on a project we were working on. And uh, uh, we needed some advi advice about uh, some tricky measurement issues. And we asked for this advice from some very renowned senior colleagues who were experts in methodology. And these colleagues told us that they weren't happy with the way our, de our dependent variables were measured. And they were really, really negative about what kind of data we had, what we wanted to do. But in our guts, we knew the data were great. And we knew that what we were trying to do was important. And we also knew that we shouldn't be deterred by their reaction. But I have to say that their negativity really dampened our progress for quite some time. And as it turns out, as we suspected, the data were really great data. And they have led to several great publications. And you know, so uh, I guess my counsel is that you know, it's important to have heroes and pay attention to their counsel. Uh, we all have heroes, people that we admire and inspire us. But you also have to pay attention to your own counsel. More than once, I've seen the second example of junior colleagues feeling torn apart by feedback that they received from our senior colleagues. I remember one junior colleague, for example, he'd recently gotten a rejection from a top-tier journal. And uh, after that, he had asked several of our senior colleagues to give him some advice on how to proceed. Of course, as you'd expect, each colleague gave him different advice, contradictory advice, and it was all, all conflicting advice. Uh, it would have taken his paper in several different directions. And he literally didn't know what to do. And after all these, these you know, after all these, all these really wise people had given him feedback, they'd taken the time to do it, and what if he didn't follow their advice? In the end, he was paralyzed. And I have to say, regrettably, the paper has never seen the light of day. I maintain that my colleague needed to decide for himself what was right and listen to his own inner voice. But as E.E. E. Cummings said, you know, the hardest challenge is to be yourself in a world where everyone is trying to make you be somebody else. 
you also really need to have rich collaborations and relationships. It may sound as if I just told you one thing and now I'm telling you another. Be autonomous, I say, and now I say, oh, you know, attend to collaborations and relationships. We know that great research requires both. Salutary lives require both. You have to toggle between the two. You know, much of my work has been collaborative and I've grown tremendously in those relationships and I've been able to do things that I would not have been able to do without my collaborators and vice versa. You know, I think I've enabled my collaborators as well. But it hasn't happened all the time in my collaborations and I've found through hard experience that, you know, some projects were just plain enervating. It was like pulling teeth to get the project done. I guess my counsel is that you must pay attention to whether the relationship is energizing or innovating. And if it's enervating and more work than not, then you have to cut loose. You're also going to want to give praise to your collaborators. It pays off in the end. We know that small politenesses have huge consequences. And of course, most of all, you're going to have to attend to the relationships in your personal life. You know, pay attention to family. Find friends. Academe, especially in your early years when you're getting your work into the net, means a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice. But you never get those days back, so you can't ignore your personal life. You know, I think the question of how you can do great research has many answers and many solutions. There's no one right way. In the end, we're all left to tailor our own solutions to fit our own problems and contexts. So, to what I've already said, I want to add two more things. One is that you have to trust in the cosmic logic of your work, and the second is you want to build resilience. You know, in the first years before tenure, I kept hearing that I had to de develop my own voice, I had to establish my program or stream of research, and the way that I encoded that was as a coherent set of studies whereby one study led directly to the next study and that led directly to the next. But that isn't really how I work. You know, I don't see myself as flighty and I certainly think that I have a relatively stable set of interests that, be can, that uh, can be characterized in a, a number of ways. I try to pursue things that really pique my interest, ideas that I think have been taken for granted in our field and need somebody to re-examine them. But as I was worrying before tenure and making sense of my work and trying to see how it all fit together, I was talking to one of my very wise, pragmatic and much younger sisters and she said something that made me feel a whole lot better. And I think about this a lot and she said, you know, even if others can't see the predominant pattern to your work, there has to be a cosmic logic for what you've done. The stream of research idea hasn't worked for me, so I like to think of it more as a cosmic logic, a kind of constellation or different set of points in the same sky that I can connect together in a number of ways. You now, finally, you really need to build your resilience. You need to think about, you know, how are you going to stay fresh and alive? Academic life is complicated. There are multiple role demands, multiple opportunities. It's filled with pressures and standards that some people think are becoming too oppressive and unreasonable. You know, some people snap when confronted with all of these hardships. Other people snap back. Creating, per persevering, and sustaining an academic life really requires that we also develop our resilience, that we pay attention to our physical and our mental health in order to be able to travel the arduous road to make the many personal and professional sacrifices ne necessary to bring our visions into reality. Great research rarely comes cheap. And I think it doesn't necessarily require extraordinary conditions, as I've tried to highlight here today. I hope some of these ideas for how you can enact the social contextual conditions for your own future success make sense. How you can persevere, how you can endure through multiple and competing demands and slights and various disappointments, and how you can sustain your enthusiasm and energy for work and life in the long term. So I'm going to stop there. Again, I want to thank you for this honor and uh, the opportunity to speak to you today in this kind of weird uh, way. I'm very disappointed that I'm not there in person, 
The annual meetings for me have always been a source of energy and renewal, and I can only imagine the excitement of the conference. I wish you all the best conference ever, and I hope our paths cross again in the future.